Uh, so hello again. Uh, thank you for coming back after I didn't scare you away the first time. Uh, the, today we're going to talk a little bit about design and the importance of design, uh, particularly in the context of doing software development kinds of things. So if you ask somebody what is design, you get about 4,000 different answers. Nobody has a clear, concise, consistent definition for exactly what constitutes design. But it's very clear that there's at least two different categories or two different uh, schools of design. So when you have people uh, like uh, uh, Brooks in No Silver Bullet talking about the only uh, future for good design is better designers. Uh, or you hear about uh, people like Christopher Alexander talking about design, initially at least. They're, they're talking about a thing called engineering design. And most of what we're familiar with in the world of software is this engineering design. It comes out of uh, you know, a long tradition of engineering where software engineers were inside the uh, computer science departments. So it's unsurprising that when people talk about design, they're talking about this particular kind of design. But in engineering design, uh, all of your variables are known or at least in principle knowable. Uh, so Ernst Mach, for instance, once said, oh, if I knew the current position and vector of every atom in the universe, I could tell you exactly what the universe is going to look like in a thousand years. Because in principle, you could know the position and vector of every atom in the universe. Uh, and you could, according to deterministic rules and laws, uh, predict exactly where they would be at some point in the future. Uh, and now all these variables, of course, have to be quantifiable uh, in some, some fashion. Uh, all the relationships among the variables are known, and all of them are amenable to some kind of formal statement. Uh, e equals mc squared kind of formal statement. The system uh, that are amenable to engineering design are very complicated. They can be quite large. Um, the problems that you confront doing engineering design can be really difficult, very hard. Uh, design ultimately, however, is just an optimization problem. What is the best way to get all of these uh, elements and relations among the elements into the right configuration so that you can optimize some goal or objective uh, with your design? What I'm calling natural design uh, comes from uh, the art world. Uh, it comes from uh, professions uh, that are called applied arts. It comes from architecture. Uh, John Ivey, for instance, is a designer. He's a product designer uh, who was credited with a huge chunk of Apple's success, uh, particularly with the iPhone, uh, when it, it came out. Um, that is an applied artist. Production, uh, product design is an applied art. Uh, graphic design is an applied art. Architecture is a combination of engineering design and artistic design or an applied art design. When the artist sits down and sketches out uh, a big, huge, beautiful building, uh, he's, uh, she or he is using an artistic kind of a design or natural design. And then they have to sit down and do the blueprints for the uh, contractors to follow. And that's engineering design. Um, very few, well, most of the variables can be known, but there are a significant number of variables that are unknown and are in fact, in principle, unknowable. You just can't know them. Uh, they are dynamic and highly situational. Uh, the idea of a formal specification of a complex system is mythological. Uh, systems is complex, problems are wicked means every single solution, not every single, many, many solutions totally redefine the problem. And so therefore become immediately irrelevant as soon as you uh, arrive at them. Uh, design is a satisficing problem. Now this is kind of ironic 
because uh, the man that I mentioned on Monday, uh, Herbert Simon, who wrote the Bible on uh, sciences of the artificial, uh, which is uh, engineering design and you know formalism and mathematics and everything else, he won the Nobel Prize in economics for this concept of satisficing, uh, which is a solution that's good enough. Uh, software developers uh, have confront design in a number of specific different ways. Uh, we worry about our code design. We worry about the design of our programs. Uh, we worry about frameworks, uh, architectures, and even platforms uh, like designing a browser. Uh, we should, but don't very often, be thinking about solution design, uh, system design, not architecture, but system design, and object design. And you'd think that being object people with small talk and all these kinds of fun things, we'd kind of have that one down. Uh, but we have not done as well as we might have. So let's talk about code design for a minute. This is an example that I took out of a, the, my 1985-86 methods book. So it was the uh, tutorial book back in the days when you used to get a big thick manual with your software on a five and a half inch floppy disk. Uh, this this uh, example, design example, code design example was in that manual. So we have known these kinds of things for a long time. But the example begins with a Java program to count the unique occurrences of a letter uh, in some arbitrary string that you enter into the system. Has three explicit loops uh, in, the, in the code. Um, it's not bad Java, it works, or it should work. Uh, the, the book authors claimed that it worked. Um, I've never tried to compile it. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's a program that does the job just fine. This is a small talk program that does the same thing. And it's obviously far superior to the Java program. It's only half the size. And it only has one explicit loop in it. So much better design. Much, much, much better design. Right? Well, kind of. Yeah. This is the small talk programmer program that a person that thought about design of what they were doing and that thinking about design included a better grasp or comprehension of what materials they were designing with, i.e. the small talk class library. So now you have no explicit loops. Uh, you are uh, doing some other kinds of interesting things as well, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, but um, it's design that would get you to that third one. Now, one of the really interesting things, we've been hearing a lot about testing, and we've been hearing a lot about uh, you know, the uh, uh, red-green refactor. When Kent Beck first did extreme programming, uh, his mantra was design a little, code a little, test, or design a little, code a little, repeat. And then he got into the testing and it became, you know, uh, test a little, uh, code a little, refactor or design a little. So the design came after or at the end of the cycle, not at the beginning of the cycle. Uh, and as a result, you can say, well, I can look at this, uh, this code. And can you think of a way that you could refactor the middle line of code or the middle block of code till you got to the, the right-hand side of code? I can't see a way that uh, simply refactoring, testing, coding, refactoring would get me there. Uh, I have to think about the design of what it is that I'm doing. And that has some really interesting consequences. Yes. Why did I use that code? Because it was in a 1985 manual that I thought was cool. 
<laughs> and because it's illustrating the kinds of points that I w was making about uh, where design plays a role. Um, but there are some implications of our code and the presence or absence of design in our code. First thing, all, all of your programs, all code is completely arbitrary. Uh, if you look at the fact that all of our programming is ultimately uh, based on the theoretical knowledge of a Turing machine, the Turing machine has an infinite tape. That means there's an infinite space in which you can craft your programs, a sequence of ones and zeros or a sequence of uh, uh, statements, which means that there is quite literally an infinite number of programs that will do the exact same thing. So reach into that set of an infinite number of programs that do X, and anyone you pull out is completely an arbitrary solution. There's no way uh, to, to say that it is the solution. All code is idiosyncratic. Every line of code that you write reflects your personality, your knowledge, your design, your whatever. Um, it is your expression of your thinking. So it's idiosyncratic. You can get code by committee. COBOL was built by a committee. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's not idiosyncratic. There is no objective way to say that this block of code is better than this block of code or that this block of code is even correct. All you can do is create some kind of, again, equally arbitrary secondary uh, criteria by which you judge or evaluate the correctness or the goodness of a bit of code. So for a long time, code was considered to be really good if it had, uh, if it ran on a really tiny footprint and if it was um, uh, fast to execute. Machine speed and memory footprint were the de facto criteria by which you evaluated whether a block of code was good or bad or better than another. Uh, right now, judging from a lot of the presentations that I have seen here, a block of code is really, really good if you have a whole lot of tests. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, when you start writing code, you almost always start with something small. And in fact, you're told that this is the best way that you should develop software is that you should grow it. You shouldn't sit down and try to conceive of a million line program off the top of your head and then write it. You should build a hundred line program that works and then start elaborating and building it, which is really cool. It's appropriate. Uh, the problem for design is that the, whatever mental model, whatever design you had it in your head when you wrote that hundred line program that worked is still there. It ends up becoming a legacy uh, straitjacket around your head. When you get to that million line program, it's the same model. It's the same design. Which leads to things like uh, vis um, um, Visual Studio. Visual Studio, yeah, uh, Microsoft's product. It's the most popular, most widely used uh, development tool, development environment in the world. Uh, a study was done by it, uh, commissioned, Chris Granger did the study and discovered that 98% of it was unused. So you've got this uh, tens of millions of lines of code and 98% of it is never touched by those millions of developers out there that are using it. And it's because the model is not useful. The model does not facilitate the use of the tool to accomplish the job. And Granger noticed that the tool supports a way of thinking about what's going on inside of the machine. It does not support a way of thinking about what is my problem and how am I going to solve it. So the only way that you can, and again, this is an arbitrary criteria, I'll admit it right off the top of my head, or, you know, top of the talk. Uh, the only correct way to judge the goodness of a program is its 
congruency and conformity to the problem space that created the problem in the first place. This is not a concept that Christopher Alexander calls fit. That all of the forces that shape the problem are resolved by the solution in a way that you have the same kind of uh, shape or form, which is fit. <clears throat> I'm going to mention just briefly program design. Uh, because this, this is uh, also from the uh, 1972, I think is the first time I encountered this, 1971. Uh, this is a program structure chart. A hierarchical control uh, kind of uh, program design that is still pervasive in uh, everything that we do. Uh, Top module is the master control module. The uh, ones on um, my right, your left, are uh, the afferent modules that bring data into the system. The ones on that side are the efferent modules that take data out of the system. The ones in the middle are the transform modules that do the work. This is everywhere. If you, ha if you have a program with a main, You've got a master control module of your main, and you have a whole bunch of subroutines, which are these other kinds of modules going on. But you can see it just in the code itself. Uh, the master control module is whoever is uh, calling these explicit loops. The explicit loops are themselves master control modules uh, controlling dumb data. It goes into the object design with a single uh, uh, explicit loop. It's mostly absent from this one because in this one you have two pure objects. You have a prompter object and you have a bag object and they pass information to each other but neither one of them is doing any kind of explicit control on the other. So this is a superior design for that reason. It escapes that master control module. Uh, architectural design, not going to talk about this a lot, but a lot of effort goes into uh, different kinds of ways of thinking about architecture. There's uh, 16 uh, general common patterns of architectures <coughs> that have been published. Um, I want to get to uh, the, the core of this, which is um, solution design and the things that I don't think that we know a lot about at this point in time. So this is a quote from Alexander, and it gets to that notion of fitness, that every solution to a problem, uh, it begins with an understanding of a context and then shaping a solution to fit that context. And when the two things are, con are congruent, uh, the way that a, a mirror for a telescope uh, would come to meet the uh, conform, the, uh, the, the uh, problem uh, space, which is the curvature of some kind of a blank or template. When you grind the glass down until you can put soot black on there and see no, nothing but black on your lens, uh, that's when you know that you have found the right solution. The solution fits the problem. Alexander tries to mathematize uh, all of this and come up with a science of design, uh, basically fails, <coughs> and uh, heads off to uh, talk about things like the quality without a name as the criteria for good design, uh, Quan. Uh, but the idea of uh, form, uh, form being the congruency between a context and a shape uh, is consistent throughout his work. Uh, you can visualize this a little bit with these two kinds of examples. Uh, the child's toy where you put the star in the star-shaped hole and the uh, block in the block-shaped hole and so on. What Alexander tried to do was something like what's over there, where he would identify a number of forces and say that these forces create a context that has this specific shape 
And your job then is to resolve each of those forces such that you come up with a solution shape that is congruent, that there is no, uh, ultimately no space between those two kinds of things. And he develops a very intensive mathematics that demonstrates exactly how you do this. I have uh, a friend, uh, Richard Gabriel, who is a mathematician, a pretty good mathematician. He's a Lisp programmer, but we forgive him for that. Um, uh, who went through Alexander's math and says it just flat out doesn't work. So uh, Alexander is pulling the wool over our heads. Uh, plus the fact that Alexander himself doesn't actually do it with the math. Uh, he has a worked example where he's designing a village in India, and his forces are things like um, you have to marry outside of your village. So it's an ex ex uh, yeah. exogamic culture. You have to marry outside of your, your, your group. Um, or the, uh, the cattle have to be kept in a central location so that they can be fed and it has to have a barrier around it so the wild cattle don't come in and impregnate your cows and ruin your gene, gene lines. Uh, those are not exactly quantifiable or definable variables. Uh, then he draws these really weird looking diagrams. Uh, uh, looks like an urn with a whole bunch of lines inside of it. And that's his design. Uh, so he doesn't do the math himself either. But it's, it's, the idea is still right. The idea of conformity or congruency between solution and context is very real. So if we look at system design, and you saw this slide on Monday if you were here. If we think about a system, whether it's complex or not, but particularly when we think about a complex system with a very simple kind of notion, this the system that your first focus has to be on. You have to define what the system is, how it works, what you know about it, what it's doing, uh, where it's messing up. This is the context. Everything that you are going to write as your software has to conform to and be consistent with this context. It has to fit into that system. Uh, so you have to uh, know the system. Uh, in recent years, one of the uh, many trends, uh, the one that I would pay the most attention to is domain-driven design. Uh, microservices and so on don't interest me very much, but uh, domain-driven design is very interesting because it recognizes this exact problem. That if you do not... No, I, I did and then I came back. Yes. <laughs> um, that uh, domain-driven design is focused on understanding this system, the context. Uh, of the problem. Uh, so I would pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, object design. This is the one that we should be really good at, but we are not necessarily. Uh, I mentioned behavior-driven objects, that an object is what it does. If you go back to the very earliest uh, things written on objects by Alan Kay, and then later by Ward Cunningham, well, Ward never wrote anything. Kent Beck always wrote the stuff. Uh, but Kent and Ward Cunningham uh, invented the CRC card, Class Responsibility Collaborator card, as a way of collecting and documenting what the behaviors were of your objects. So this was the beginning point of object design, is what are my objects doing? Corollary to that is the idea of how are my objects communicating with each other. Uh, the diagram up in the corner, that is from Rebecca Wirf's Brock book on responsibility-driven design. And it shows the potential interaction pathways uh, via a thing called contracts uh, between objects. Uh, her diagrams are static, but you can imagine animating this uh, diagram and actually following the flow of messages from object to object around uh, the program or around the system. Uh, 
It would be a very interesting thing to do that. It's also a huge step on the way to what Alan Kay said he should have called objects in the first place. It should not have been object-oriented design because that focuses people's attention on the things and what those things are instead of focusing on the conversations among the things and what those things do. So uh, uh, I don't think I've ever seen in a production environment in a real world environment, anyone using Rebecca's diagrams. They just uh, never got any traction whatsoever. But it would have gone a long way if we had been thinking in this way and if we had been thinking about designing our programs uh, and designing our objects as behavioral entities following scripts. It would have made a big difference from a design perspective. The uh, biggest problem with uh, Kent Beck's CRC cards is that there's a huge gap between your CRC card and your code and implementing your code. So when I started teaching objects back in the 90s, uh, I conceived of this notion or idea of an object cube. So uh, the object cube has a side which is just the name and the description of the object. Technically, yes, it's a class, but I always think of it as an object. Um, and then the responsibilities of that object, which is what comes from the CRC card. So the first two sides of the object cube are the CRC card. But then, uh, in keeping with the idea of I am what I do, I stop and think about, okay, what do I need to know if I'm going to do this? And because I need to know it doesn't mean that I have to memorize it. It does not have to be part of my structure or my contents. It may be. I may have an object that I collaborate with that I just happen to have hanging around in, my, in one of my instance variables. But I can also get access to that object uh, as an argument to the message that asks me to perform some particular kind of a service. I can also get access to that by going to some kind of a global variable or some kind of a local global, like in an application, in a thread, in a, in a, a session. Uh, it doesn't have to be an absolute uh, global. I can also manufacture that knowledge on the spot. So for instance, I might have a responsibility to tell you how old I am. I do not store that knowledge or that information. Uh, it changes too often. See, it just changed again. I'm now older. Um, so I computed. I do store my date of birth because that seems like a reasonably static thing that I can keep hanging around. Uh, and I go and get today's date from the system clock, a global. And then I compute my age and I tell it to you. I won't. <laughs> uh, but then I can think about, okay, now how do I want to be politely asked to do the things that I am saying that I can do? I'm saying I can fulfill these responsibilities. Well, how do you know how to ask me to do so? So I publish a protocol. And my protocol has to be the format of the message I expect to receive. Uh, it also has to include any information that I may need in order to provide the service to you if I have indicated in my protocol that I need that information. And it has to include exactly what you're going to get back. Um, and then the events, things that I am willing to share with the outside world, like I'm an airplane object and I just got hijacked. That's an event that I think should be shared. And I think there might be a federal marshal somewhere that wants to uh, uh, know that. But ultimately, it comes back to what Fred Brooks said in No Silver Bullet. Better design comes from better designers. This is uh, his quote from No Silver Bullet saying that. The world's first programmer, or considered to be the world's first programmer, although what she published was not a program, it was a stack trace. Um, uh, to, uh, what the computer had to do, what the uh, analytic engine would have to do in order to produce the Fibonacci numbers. But she's a first programmer, and she talks about herself. She's not at all shy about 
uh, her accomplishments or her abilities. But she talks about having this really cool mind, and she also talks about having this breadth of knowledge so that she can cast rays from multiple different places and synthesize and put them together uh, in a meaningful way to create a better designer. So she was a great designer. Uh, she never programmed anything because it never existed. She's a great designer. Uh, the discipline of architecture was uh, discovered in Rome by a guy named Vitruvius. He was considered to be the world's first architect. He wrote a number of books on architects, architecture and what it means to be an architect. And he defines what qualities an architect has to have. And these are the exact same qualities that a good designer must have. You have to know everything that there is to know. So this list of things that an architect in Vitruvius's time is the complete curriculum of universities at the time Vitruvius was writing this. Now, you do not have to literally know everything that there is to know, but you have to know a huge breadth. It's what the business world calls a modern polymath. Someone who has multiple dimensions of expertise uh, with multiple dimensions of deep expertise and is able to not only put them together, uh, but to use them as bridges for communication across the team. And if you don't have this set of skills, uh, you're not going to be very good at design. Uh, you look at the design community, the applied arts community, and it's all about this modern polymath kind of stuff going on in design teams. And the only way to do this, of course, is to read. So how many people have wrote, read a book this week? A whole book. Started it and finished it this week. It's been a busy week. <laughs> uh, how many of you wrote a book today? Read a book today? Started it this morning and finished it by 11 o'clock? Nobody. I did, but I, I don't count. Uh, my colleagues are smiling at me. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is the way that you get to be a polymath. And one of the reasons that is really important is, again, if you're a good designer, you've got to be metaphor-driven, not technology-driven. But 